this is the first episode of the Visionary Vibes, a podcast where we're going to talk about business, emerging tech, and just the economy in general. And most importantly, we're going to talk about the tech which is actually relevant today, that can be used today. And we try, we're going to try to really go into details to, um, to make all of the emerging tech really simple. And our first guest on this podcast is Ash. Ash is a serial entrepreneur, an expert in ID verification, web free, and now as everyone pretty much looking into AI and also a big lover and fan of Gongcha. So that's, I think that's what he asked me to say as well, but, um, Ash, just a couple of words about yourself so that we could start talking about, you know, the things you're expert in. Yeah. Thanks, man. I think, I think you're too kind with that introduction. Um, but look, my, um, my, my background has been in the sort of information security space for the last decade. Um, I founded a, a business in Australia, um, which was called Rapid ID, and we focused on helping businesses verify their customers' identities in a digital um, way. And one of the things that we uh, did really well was actually helping verify um, government-issued ident- identity documents, things like passports and driver's licenses against the issuer. Um, so. We worked with some great companies like Uber, helping verify the driver's licenses for Uber drivers, um, as well as some superannuation funds and some banking companies. We're, where I guess the um, sort of journey has taken me the last little while is into um, you know, looking at some of the advanced technologies that um, distributed, uh, distributed ledger technology can provide. So obviously blockchain, um, but also more recently having a look at um, what you know, artificial intelligence is going to do to disrupt certainly these certain industries. So I've been helping consult a number of startups. Um, I've been involved with other startups myself and I'm working for some companies to help them grow their um, market share in the, in the industry as well. So that's just really kind of what I'm, what I'm doing in a nutshell. I've got a very, I guess, simple question straight away. You know, everyone is talking about data privacy, data security, the governments and big companies, but why does it actually matter? Because, you know, as I see it, at least very often, um, people are just literally ready to give away any of that info. So as I see this, you know, yes, governments and big companies are trying to, they, their regulations, their new technologies and so on and so on. Meanwhile, you see people just randomly um, giving out all of the information they have and kind of like not really caring about the info because I've actually seen um, this statistic that 2% of people say that they're worried about their you know, data and all of the information they have online. But I kind of feel like literally if a person wants to pay it to play a game on a phone, you know, the game says, give away all of your data and information, the person will go, yep, I'm fine with that. So why, why this is even important or are we just exaggerating the importance of data privacy? No, not at all. And, um, you know, just coming back to the the point you made, like if, if I happen to you know, see the text on a consent or a terms and conditions on a game saying, give me all your data. I probably yeah. wouldn't tick it, but I do appreciate that the companies are a lot smarter at eliciting that information from us without, you know, trying to get us to look too deep into the, you know, terms and conditions. I find a lot of the um, the issues that, uh, you know, we encounter as, as citizens of our, you know, retrospective company, of our, sorry, retrospective countries and the different um, data jurisdictions. So, um, first thing is we've got that kind of prisoner's dilemma. If we want access to a service, we don't really have a choice but to accept handing over that information because, you know, I really want this rental property or I really want to get this, you know, personal loan to fund my holiday. I don't really have any alternative but to give them the information that they're asking for. I think it starts with a bit of educational awareness as an individual. So, you know, what yourself, myself and other people in the industry that understand the risks of handing over your information so easily is really just trying to help give your friends and family the, the the two cents on, hey, maybe just stop and pause. Do you really need to be doing this and handing over that information? Do you know where it's going? Do you know where it's being stored? Um, I think there are a couple of the really basic things that we can do as, as a society, but it really is going to come, or well, the change is going to come from government. And whether we like it or not, and you know, a lot of um, sort of idealists that think that decentralized um, applications are going to, you know, remove the need to have centralized authorities involved. We're seeing Absolutely. this massive um, pushback at the moment, and even recently with a lot of the sort of the banking issues that we've seen in the US. Um, you know, a lot of uh, let's just call it, you know, Web three or 
crypto friendly um, banking institutions yeah. have been essentially targeted. So um, they don't really have a choice but to play by the rules of what the government's setting. So coming back to my point is when a government says, hey, these are the requirements that you as a business have to do, such as onboarding a new customer, you have to hold their information for up to seven years. These are the issues that some of the companies that operate in, in the world are dealing with because they're like, we don't need to keep this information, but we're being told that we have to by another upstream, you know, vendor or, um, you know, authority. So I guess there's a little bit of, um, you know, change and, and discussion socially that's going to have to take place in order for businesses to relax the rules and not request as much um, from the individual for whatever service they're trying to apply for. But that kind of would be um, where I'd look at it in, in, a, in a nutshell. But going forward, then as far as I really understand, the change is mostly happening from the government, right? But does th this change actually benefit people? That's what I'm really interested in when it comes to ID verification, ID security, and so on and so on, because as it seems to me, and we'll go into blockchain and storing, you know, data um, on distributed decentralized servers, that's something probably, that's just my opinion, that the government does not want to happen. Or am I wrong here? Because I, I kind of see it as a double-edged sword because the government wants to keep everything centralized because I think I think that's the nature of the government, right? To keep things very centralized and under control. Meanwhile, if we talk actually about people, then it's mostly about decentralization and allowing every citizen to own his or her own information. So what is what is the direction are we going into you know is it is it actually an illusion that my storage blockchain um is an ut utopia and it's never going to happen or is it also in the interests of the government to allow that to happen that's kind of the thing i'm trying to understand here yeah no i appreciate it. and that's a really good question because um i would agree with you in that that is the optic at the moment um in terms of governments not wanting people to um, necessarily take full control or autonomy back with their own financial situations. And I know that's a very, um, you know, hot topic at the moment, especially around what's happening in the sort of um, financial markets. We've got, you know, uh, inflation occurring, um, you know, the sort of central digital banking currency um, projects are very much under underway. And that in, in itself is kind of a, um, a bit of evidence to show governments are actually open to um, decentralization um, within within their industries. Now, um, here in, in Australia, where I'm based, um, you look at the um, Australian uh, Stock Exchange. So they actually have a massive project that's already um, been developed and sort of um, still being worked on at the moment, but their plan is to roll everything out um, from a distributed ledger technology standpoint. So using blockchain technology to actually keep track of people's you know transactions and ledgers. So there is adoption, but the optics are that there isn't enough and it's not happening fast enough. But the pros to an individual like you and I, why we should care is, you know, ultimately our information is being used by third parties. We don't have awareness of where it's actually being used and who and who's using it and what for. And we're also not getting a clip of the ticket because our information is being monetized at some point and we don't actually get to, to share in that benefit. So that's one of the ways in which I would look at um, a really important thing for me to consider as an individual I would rather someone say, hey, can I borrow your data or can I have your permission to use it for X? And this is what I plan to make out of it. We're prepared to offer you X in return. Um, that is a much better conversation and I think a, 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 middle, a middle ground for a path forward. So I, I definitely agree, you know, on just the fact that citizens can control their information and only sort of share access to a certain piece of information if the person actually wants that to happen. But what I do not understand is sort of the, wh where is the, what is the reality at the moment? Because to me, it seems, let's say, to, to really simplify things, um, I have an app, you know, I have information about myself, I don't know, about, uh, you know, my job, my salary, and all of this is stored on, 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 on decentralized um, service, right? Storage. Um, Meaning that... Does that mean that governments will lose control of your information or like they will lose control of like what's going on with you? Um, or, or or is it still the same thing, but you just own information? 
I don't say, okay. I, I know I'm being like very abstract, but the point is, let's say, for example, just another simple example, um, that app would have, for example, credit offerings, you know, with loans and stuff like that. So right now, through a centralized banking system, the government would always really know what you're up to, you know, what loans do you have and so on and so on. But if things are really de decentralized, doesn't the government lose control of what you're actually doing? Oh, so this is... The Look, I'll give a I'll give a short answer and then explain it. Um, no, is is my response because um, at the end of the day, if you look back um, historically, and again, I'll use a reference from you know my sort of local backyard, being Australia, in the in the early eighties, um, we had a referendum go you know get t tabled in Parliament to say, hey, should we create a national ID card or a national ID system? And the Australian public voted against it because I think at the time there was also a big um, sort of concern around, you know, spying on on, infant, on their citizens as well as um, the whole Big Brother um, worry. And of course, you know, George Orwell's 1984 wasn't too far away from um, <laughs> that time of either. So ultimately, the government had to say, look, you know, this is not the this is not the play for us. But um, if you really look closely at some of the infrastructure that's already in place, whether the private sector controls and and let's say the decentralization of these um, services are actually then managed by private sector innovation, which typically tends to be where innovation comes from, not necessarily within government. The government is really just a wrapper to say, hey, when we when we look at certain rules around privacy, certain rules around data collection, certain rules around security, um, they they're really trying to be the guardrails um, to say, hey, let's let's keep things on track they shouldn't really be playing in the actual offering or service um, industry per se. But when you talk about as an individual, will the government not want to have um, us have our you know control over our own identities? Ultimately, we always will have some um, you know permission or access that the government will control because at the very beginning of our life, you know your your birth is usually recorded. And in most countries, I know that there are some that are still don't have the same, level of infrastructure, but we're getting a lot closer to that, you know, happy medium. Um, most people are going to be recorded at birth and you start off getting some sort of identifier, whether it's through a healthcare system or whether it's through, um, you know, coming of age and going into the workforce, you're given some sort of tax identifier, identification number. In Australia, we do actually already have a national ID card. It's just basically between two different industries. One is the tax, the tax department, as well as our um, health department. So ultimately the government knows everything you do from a health claim um, claim or insurance perspective as well as your earnings perspective so um, that is probably more a little bit of a philosophical debate but for the way in which I see yeah. it is there's already a um, level of control that we're never going to be able to um, take back unless a private industry comes in and starts you know managing the the births and and births and deaths registries for all countries Um but yeah, to a degree, I think there's going to be a level of information that we can keep to ourselves. We don't necessarily have to um, or shouldn't have to report certain, uh, you know, earnings that maybe aren't relevant for, you know, a, a taxation system. And that's a whole nother uh, probably discussion. But with what we're doing right now and the way that the country is set up, as well as other countries, we do have some systems that are decentralized, but majority of it is on the, on the path to becoming more decentralized. Okay, then, then my other question would be, which is, what has actually been the role and the importance of digital identities, you know, digital documents and verification? Because, you know, we're definitely going through this transition where we're getting rid of physical stuff, right? And everything is becoming digital. But correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe... So right now, the way I feel about my passport is it's mostly a travel document. It's mostly a thing that I use once or twice, you know, a month whenever I travel somewhere, and that's pretty much it. What I feel now with things going digital is that the role of the passport, once it's digital, it increases. Because suddenly, once my passport is digital, I can be connected to more banking services. I can be uh, more connected to more, I don't know, car dealerships and stuff like that. So the point, the thing I'm trying to really understand is... What is the importance of digital documents? Is it is it just going to be a digital thing of the digital copy of the physical document? Or is the the whole segment actually expanding and um, 
having new functions is yeah no again great question and to address just the first point that you made um the 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 change that is taking place right now and i know you know yourself being based in the uk um we know for a fact that you know in the next couple of years physical identification documents will be a thing of the past you know all these um things like driver's licenses um healthcare documents um citizenship you know, declarations they're all going to be digitized and they're going to become um digital you know digital form so I think it's going to take a little bit longer for the actual travel document that we refer to as a passport um, for that to become a completely digitized aspect because of the interoperability between countries. It just simply won't be there from the get-go. Um, perhaps the United Nations might be able to pull everyone together and say, hey, yeah, let's do this. There, For, for example, um, I'm not sure if you've uh, traveled and you've actually um, hired a car in a different country with an open license. If you want to do that, there's a there's an international um, driver's license that you can actually apply for. That is a document that's been provisioned by the United Nations and has been in place right. for the last 40, 50 plus years. And so it's a piece of cardboard, literally. And in order for them to change that document in different countries, it's a, it's a vote by the United Nations. So that's why that hasn't been changed yet. So that should give you a good idea of how long it will take for international travel documents to circulate through. But things that are within the individual country and have full control by that government or authorities, they're going to become digitized very, very soon. We've already seen the same thing in different states here. Okay. Then, then literally a question, because that was a good example with the, with the international driving license. Does that mean that once everything goes digital, more barriers are going to be removed and there's going to be less friction when I'm going to go, I don't know, to France, because for example, I was looking at renting a, um, just randomly, a, a, a flat on Airbnb um, in, in Paris. And it says that you need some special documents, some special French, you know, documents. And it, it just creates a lot of friction. I understand I probably have to travel to France and get that document. I have no idea what that document is about. And it kind of, it's just really frustrating. So the question is, once once all documents go digital, Will there be more value created with the infrastructure? Through, sorry, through infrastructure that will allow us to, I don't know, travel easier? So yes, in, in short, the, the value is going to come from the underlying infrastructure um, that's set up. Now, the issue we have, again, is where is that innovation and technical um, development going to come from? Is it going to come from private sector organizations that will invest in creating this interoperable system that different... Um, mm -hmm. services across country will accept as a form of or a proof of identification or access or you have the permission to 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 use so the airbnb example you know perhaps airbnb create some form of um you know an airbnb pass which you can go through their process they will verify that you you're that you're going to be a good rent renter or tenant mm -hmm. um, and then that airbnb you know certificate which is digital or token will be able to be verified and accepted by the next place that you want to go and, you know, rent an Airbnb at, for example. So um, those systems are going to have to be talking to one another in order for that to take place. Because I've, I've also got, I think, a good example um, with credit scores. So I've, I've, I've heard, I've read somewhere about an app that allows people from Latin America to move to the US and somehow keep their credit score or at least improve it or like, the app makes it easier for people from Latin America to open a new account in the US. And what is frustrating at least to me is you could have, you could have lived in the Latin America for, I don't know, 10 years. You've built your credit history. You've got tons of bank accounts. Everything is good. You move, you move to the US, I don't know, or UK, and then start from zero. And what I'm trying to understand is will doc digital documents solve this problem? Or are we just going to be living in the same governments with the same level of bureaucracy, but we're just going to be proud of that the documents are digital? Or um, am I, I don't know, if I live, I don't know, in Argentina and I have a EID, you know, electronic ID, then able to move to the US and at least somehow that helps me to prove that I had a salary, I've had a credit score. So... Uh, I've got a I've got a short answer for that, and just to kind of sort of correct the um, 
the current situation with credit and global credit. So while you're correct in saying that your credit score in a positive, affirm, like, you know, affirmation way does not come with you. So let's say you've got a good credit score in um, the UK and you want to move to the US, you yeah. will be starting from zero in terms of a positive credit worthiness. Um, mm -hmm. What actually does happen now is your negative credit score will go with you. So if you have a negative credit score somewhere, they by sure will know that you're a bad credit you know, credit worthy individual, but they don't really care about your positive credit worthiness. That's what they want to know is who are the bad actors. And a lot of um, emphasis has been put on that. So for example, you've got massive bureaus around the world, like Experian, um, Equifax, um, TransUnion. Mm -hmm. These are some like, you know, pretty big names that, that are yeah. like global and they have systems that do connect to one another. They'll, um, they'll track the kind of bad credit worthiness across, across state borders and across countries. But the services that they make money from is actually those that care about whether you have good credit. So for example, the local, um, you know, credit, credit loan or credit card providers will go, will talk to the bureaus and say, Hey, does this person have a good credit score so we can lend them money or give them a credit card? That's what we want to understand, um, for the future. My, my, my humble opinion is that I don't think we're going to get to that state anytime soon because of the way in which the businesses rely on monetization. Um, they provide a service um, to the to the world. However, there are far more um, negative side effects of having these industries in play. And one of the things is to do with the storage of information and the data breaches that have happened from these big um, credit bureaus. Um, Equifax is a very public one that ha that happened a number of years ago, and people still are dealing with the um, repercussions of their information being you know ciphered off or stolen by hackers. Um, and that's because their information is being used to create other fake identities and other fake accounts in their name and they're trying to backtrack and figure out, all right, well, where, where do I have to, um, you know, talk to local authorities and it's taking up a lot of time, money, resources, and it's putting stress on our, um, you know, on the government, you know, resources as it is to go and find what's gone wrong. How do we prevent it in the future? So we're in this little bit of a, um, a difficult period where we rely on these services, but we also don't want to have to rely on these services. And the nature and the relationship between the banks and the credit bureaus is what you know fuels this kind of industry at the moment. So when we talk about having a single um, you know global pass that might allow you to bring your credit score from one country to another, there is a p potential that that could happen. My my view is that I don't think it will happen anytime soon. We're far more likely to have a you know a travel document that would be seen interoperable. But before we get cross credits and, and cross um, banking kind of services, um, you know, we've seen neobanks and that's not the, the, the topic that we're talking yeah, about. Yeah. It's more like credit worthiness. There is a lot of um, complex, you know, in-country uh, regulations that prohibit certain information from being passed across borders and then they're being used by different services. Mm -hmm. So it's possible. I just don't know when or, or where it ha or how it will happen. Okay, so, but then, look, we've discussed that ID verification and having digital verification, digital documents is an important thing, but I still do not genuinely, I actually, I actually do not understand sometimes where innovation will come from because the government, um, very often, uh, big banks, you know, all the credit agencies and so on and so on are these gatekeepers. So if you as a startup want to innovate in this segment and you see these numbers, you see like yeah, digital verification is growing. All of the numbers are growing in this space. But where do you begin? Because I'm, I'm trying to understand, yes, as a startup, you, you want to innovate. But then there's a ton of rules that you have to follow. And then if the rules are too strict, then it means, which is most likely the case with most of the governments, that might just remove all of the innovation. Because if you just follow the rules, then... Where is the innovation? Because most governments are just really bureaucratic. So my question here, or like, what is your take on how do you even begin doing something in this space? So two points that come out of that. One is uh, I, I do agree with what you've said um, and use Uber, Uber as a, you know, this kind of last century example. Um, there were very heavily regulated, um, yeah. you know, industries, especially around the, the taxi, um, you know, commissions in, in mm -hmm. both. You know, the US, the UK, Australia, and you've seen the the turmoil that Airbnb they created. too. Airbnb, absolutely. Um, I, I like the the example of of Uber because you literally have 
you know, taxi drivers out protesting yeah. on the street, like, hey, why are our jobs being taken? And, you know, this may be the unpopular um, viewpoint, but ultimately, you know, the taxi industry only really have themselves to blame for the ability for Uber to penetrate the market, right? Um, and this is the kind of thinking that, you know, they obviously took and I'm not saying it's ethical or unethical or right mm -hmm. or wrong, it just is. Um, but they took that stance to say, hey, we're going to continue pushing against the status quo. And eventually, you know, society agreed with the, with the stance that Uber should exist. And because they wouldn't still be here if people hadn't yep. take social stance to say, no, this, this works. So it, coming back to then the second point around um, in relation to uh, where, where I guess we see, you know, digital identity and, and how that's going to sort of formulate in the future, um, there's, there's companies already working on it they still have a long way to go um, before it's actually going to be usable for, for us as individuals. So what you're saying is just, it will take a lot of, it will take longer to develop all of these apps in, in the space of digital verification and digital identities. Because my, my whole question is, I think it's just a lot stricter to operate in this area because the reason why even the Uber model sort of worked, you could say, is, is simply because it's kind of easier to to build an app where you, you, you get a taxi rather than operating a segment where you de deal with passports, IDs, and residence cars, and so on. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think um, take the take the credit credit score example. Um, there are companies that do exist that have already um, started to build the decentralized um, credit score system um you know take bloom um so if you go to check out their website bloom.co um they started building the underlying kind of architecture now the dilemma that you have is you've you're gonna have to extract the existing information from somewhere so where is the where is that yep. found and of course it's at what we call the source of truth so you know credit bureaus in certain regions how are you going to extract that and then be able to take that and then allow someone to carry on this is the um, you know, dilemma because ultimately the, the companies that have the source of truth, they don't want that to happen because all, obviously then their business model becomes, you know, not, not as valuable. So there's going to come a point where friction is going to occur, but it's going to come in a very fast way in which people have managed to get this kind of critical mass and overnight we'll have another Uber, but it will be for the digital identity or the, or the, or the, or the identity war race. Okay, and another question then, because we talk, we always talk about ID verification and identity, I guess, uh, from a very, very wide angle, a problem that exists a lot in the UK um, is, so let's say a person has been paying for 10, 15, 20 years, um, just their rent, right? So, and then they try to get a mortgage and the bank still says, hey, your credit score is not enough or something like that. Meanwhile, the person is saying, hey, I've been paying for 15 years rent that is bigger than uh, than the mortgage you know I'm asking for. So the payments are going to be even smaller. How does that even work? So the question that I guess I want to ask, do you think if we talk about ID verification, which is obviously tied to finances, are we going to see alternative systems being yeah. developed? Because it's... Even this example with a mortgage, I think it's pretty insane that the banks would say no to a person who hasn't, you know, hasn't missed a payment in those 50 years, yet can't get a mortgage. Correct. And um, to, to be fair, that's actually already happened. Um, I've, I've spoken with another founder who um, has worked on a, a similar kind of concept to try and create the, um, this type of alternative credit as a service. So people could, could apply for loans using things like rental payments or continual, you know, fixed payments that are, you know, not necessarily other mortgages or big assets, but they're paying off a, a steady kind of um, amount. Um, they've actually used this as a case study to say, hey, we want to apply for a rental property. We don't have necessarily credit scores, but we've got some Airbnb um, payments that have actually taken place and they use that and it yeah. was accepted. Now, the, the issue with that from a um, mass adoption is that that is an individual that has taken initiative themselves. Now, us as consumers typically want to have the, you know, one click and, and have it done for us. Yep. So nobody has, nobody has successfully built that as a service and then allowed banks and, and, you know, credit providers to actually connect to it. So that opportunity is still out there to somebody to develop, but it is being thought of and, and the discussions are being had. Now, when it comes to 
um, the the kind of situation around you know where where does your identity sit? Um, you know, ultimately, it's you know the individual. It's up to you to try and um, prove you are who you say you are. You take the information off um, certain sources of truth, but they have to be validated. Um, it's still a very complex process, and nobody has solved that that issue, especially on a um, global standpoint. Yeah, but once again, I think it's a very, it's a very, you know, rational answer that you're giving because literally two weeks ago, I even tr I applied for a credit card, and so I, I normally use an Amex, right? And uh, we've accepted my usual documents. I've applied for another credit card, and then they've declined it and said hey, we need more information or this information doesn't work for us and so on and so on. So what is just insane to me that you as a human, you can, your your documents can be accepted in one place. Meanwhile, you go to any other place, especially if you move to another country and your identity is gone. You can keep proving anything to people, but they would say, no, we're declining you. The, the, you know, the, and this is a good example, right? What you've just said. And I've, I've just had, you know, someone close to me has also applied for a, a new credit card. You know, I think it's that time of year where everyone's looking to refresh their, um, the credit card with the um, flying or bonus points that you get. So I think Amex have, you know, a, a card that you can get some, you know, Virgin Velocity points or Qantas points or, you know, uh, United points or whatever it might be. Now, when they had to submit the documents, um, they were asked to submit, you know, proof of income. So they uploaded a remittance statement, which is essentially your employer saying, this is how much we paid you. Now, because it's a, it has the words remittance statement on it, the yeah. Amex actually contacted them saying, oh, sorry, we don't accept this, this type of document. We need pay slips. They're exactly the same document. They're exactly, the, it has exactly the same figures and the numbers will be printed on. It's just that the words are remittance statement versus pay slip. Now, this is the whole issue we have with you know interpretation the underlying um, legislation that might govern certain bodies everybody takes it and interprets it how they need to interpret it so um, you know if we talk about um, applying for certain documents in the UK you know in another couple of years time you may not be having to provide all the um, documents that you that you have to right now we might have a situation where there is a um, single um, you know app that has connected all your existing sources of truth and then you simply will put your face in the camera to authorize and say, yep, my face is my password or my face is the authentication layer that says, yes, approve me for this application. That would be the utopia that we're trying to get to. But there's a long way to get to that from where we are now and and what we hope to what we hope to achieve. Okay. But if you were to give sort of a final answer on this, do you still think that all of these favorable conditions should firstly come from the governments or should it be the private sector doing the maximum they can, like literally just pushing and pushing and then sort of, I mean, you can't say force, but at least push the governments in the right direction. My, my, my inner entrepreneur says it's got to come from the individual and the private sector. Um, because at the end of the day, um, you're building things, um, without an agenda and it's pure kind of innovation and in order to get or tackle a, an issue like this it has to come from some place of you know you've got some sort of drive or passion behind it and usually the businesses that are successful have stemmed from solving a problem now the problem that would be solved is complexity security scalability interoperability and cost because um, you know providing services or understanding who, who who somebody is online does have some cost prohibitive um, you know, barriers. So I think the individuals and private sector should be the ones driving this. However, that's with a caveat in that I think in order for things to move faster, we are going to need some, you know, cooperation from government bodies. And you need to have the right people in government that aren't trying to battle or fight against other agendas. Exactly. To, al to align with the, the, the long-term view of this kind of idea or concept. Yeah. So what you what you're saying that there should be sort of no space for a certain political, I don't know, direction. It, it should be kept pretty much neutral. Is is that right? Correct. Because the 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 underlying issue, and we talk about you know who owns your identity right now. And at the moment, I would argue and say that governments typically own your identity at the very source, because private companies that do provide services on top 
we'll still be talking to the government bodies to say, hey, can we check this information is still up to date or accurate at your record level? Um, so that's where I would I would put that standpoint. Now, in order for obviously us to kind of shift the paradigm, you're going to need to have a lot of individuals using you know XYZ service or global ID. But I think if we don't if we don't have some correct you know um, rules put in place, mm -hmm. all we're going to do is we're going to shift it from one entity to another entity. I think we as individuals need to be very careful in that, hey, this shiny new tool or shiny new, new toy has come along where we're all going to go over here, but all of a sudden we've just created another, another data lake and that entity is monetizing everyone 10 times more than what the government was or what those you know intermediary bodies were previously. Now we're in a, if potentially worse position because it's going to be so much harder to, to undo that um, and then actually move it to a you know, self-sovereign state again. So, and self-sovereign being you as the individual own the information. So it, it, it's complex. It's, it's not yeah. straightforward. <laughs> it, it is, it, it's very easy to understand the, the, the high level concept in that we should be able to control and own our information, but how we get to that state, a, yeah. a lot needs to happen. I mean, I'm, I'm actually super happy that we went that, you know, that detail, that deep on this topic. But final question for you today is, look, for any entrepreneurs that are going to or considering building something in the ID, uh, identity verification or digital uh, document space, it's one thing looking at the product and at the startup from a sort of angle of, you know, tech and building. And I think that's where, you know, you might have a bit of perfectionism and utopia and be, yeah, we need this and that. But you also have to understand the realities of, you know, politics, governments, bureaucracy, and so on and so on. So give me, I don't know, you know, two or three things that you think are important to consider, you know, for anyone who's, who's going to build something or operate a business in this segment. Because otherwise, the fear that I have too many people might just get caught up in just building the standing, like what's really going on in the street. Yeah, and look, to, to answer your question, um, I think it's, it can't be, this, this isn't a, a new concept, but you've heard the phrase, um, you know, don't get caught building in an ivory tower. Um, you know, the idea that somebody is just sitting there building what they think is cool stuff, but they're not really validating with customers to say, hey, do you need this? Um, it might be something freaking amazing, but ultimately it won't be adopted or used by anyone. So the first thing would be validate the the concept and actually see uh, see what the kind of market landscape looks like. So there's a good book by um, Peter Thiel. He's one of the first you know outside investors in Facebook. He created Clarium Capital, but he was also one of the PayPal mafia. So with himself, Elon Musk, and Reid Hoffman, they they founded PayPal together. And Peter Till's been a very successful entrepreneur and, and venture cap. Ah, there he is. He's got it in the background there. <laughs> nice. You, you know exactly where we're heading. I think any any entrepreneur that's looking to start out or build something, that would be a very good starting point. It doesn't tell you how to build a startup. It just says, let's go from zero to one in that what is the concept and how are you going to get to that first stage of you know innovation? And he talks a lot about how are you going to differentiate from the closest competitors in the market? Because right now in the identity in the identity market alone, it is very competitive. It has been an industry that has been growing rapidly since you know the late 2000s, and more and more um, businesses are starting to um, consolidate in the industry as it stands. Mm -hmm. So if you are wanting to build something in that particular segment, be sure that it is something that's going to get very quick mass adoption. You've got the right distribution partners already in place. You've got the right technology that's going to be a differentiator. And you've got a different model to how things currently stand. Because at the moment, there is a lot of this, you know, racing to the bottom in terms of pricing points and, and things are just getting, you know, cheaper and cheaper. Margins are getting tighter and tighter. So the model needs to change. Um, I know that that sounds a little bit doom and gloom in terms of starting, but it's not to say it's not possible. It's just be aware and do your research before jumping in. So as I understand, the same principles apply, you know, to building a startup as in, in any other industry. Correct. Yeah. It's no, it's no different. You know, we, the, the identity and the information security space just deals with, um, a, you know, tends to be a lot more sensitive information on a continual basis. 
um, the authentication programs where systems need to connect to one another, those need to be protected like crazy because you've got a lot of malicious parties out there that are continually trying to um, cause, you know, man in the middle attacks, meaning, you know, when you've got two bits of information trying to cross over, someone's trying to sit there in the middle and collect all the information for their own benefit. These are just, you know, small examples of constant day-to-day -day, um, attacks mm -hmm. that these companies are facing. And there are a lot of people out there that place a lot of value on the data that's being processed. So um, it just means in order to start from ground, from ground, you know, from the ground floor, you're going to have to invest more than more. people that start their yeah. businesses, you know, five, 10 years before you. It's a lot more capital and labor intensive to actually build something than it was, you know, the, the startup before you. Okay. Final, final question. Do you think it's possible to be a small player in the ID roof? verification or identity space or is it only a place where you either go very big or <laughs> it's the end of the start no it's a, it's a really good question and i i think um the short answer is actually yes and the and the reason i say that is there is always yes a you need. can be a small startup yes you can be a small startup in the space and the reason being um you may find a niche opportunity or to solve a problem Nothing. within a small group of companies. You could, those problems might be really big headaches for those, for those companies. So you may be able to charge okay. a higher margin for those services and it might be enough to sustain. So you, while you may not have the significant volume that other companies might have, you might be able to do a, you know, one to two, um, you know, deals or transactions or, or tasks per month, but you might be able to charge a couple of thousand dollars for it, depending on the, the pain that that individual or company has. So I don't ever like to say, you know, never say never, but um, <laughs> it, it'll be a lot harder to get to a very big scalability yeah. scaling point. Find your niche if, if you want to be that kind of small vendor and, and find an opportunity. Otherwise, um, you know, make sure that you've, you've done your research and, and the due diligence on where you want to play in the space. No, that's, that's great. So want to say thank you for being the, the first guest on the, this podcast and this show, Visionary Vibes, uh, because it was really good to really go very, very deep um, into digital identity, digital documents, verifications, and stuff like that. And hopefully this will be helpful to for, for anyone who's going to launch something in this space. So once again, thanks for joining and hope to see you again.